Cyrus the Messiah In 539 BC, the legendary Persian ruler Cyrus the Great conquered the city of Babylon. It was a major world event and led to some pretty significant repercussions. His conquest of Babylon resulted in the exiled Jews returning to their homeland. The temple in Jerusalem was built and the Jewish people were able to collect their ancestral texts and put them together to create the first five books of the Bible. The Jews were so happy with what Cyrus the Great did that one of the biblical authors called him Cyrus the Messiah. He was considered the Messiah 500 years before Jesus was ever born. It's in the prophetic book allegedly written by the prophet Isaiah where Cyrus is called the Messiah. It says that Cyrus is God's anointed and that God facilitated Cyrus's conquest to help the Jewish people reclaim their homeland. The book is an important piece of work for Christians because it contains most of the prophecies that were used later as predictions of the Messiah. However, these prophecies are now understood to be Jesus, not Cyrus. But if we look at the dates of these Christian texts, we can see that Isaiah is talking about the Persian king, not a carpenter who wouldn't be born for another half a millennia. Who wrote the Old Testament? The greatest unanswered question in all of Christianity is, who wrote the Bible? Scientists and theologians have been pondering the question for centuries. The simple answer is that the Bible has had many authors over the centuries. It all started with the Old Testament, describing the history of the Israeli people over a 1,000-year period. It starts with the creation of life and then delves into moral lessons that were originally designed to form a foundation for people to live a good and moral life. It's generally accepted among religious people that the entirety of the Old Testament was written by Moses. He wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These books make up the Torah, which is the same book as the Old Testament. However, certain parts of the book were written differently. Anyone studying the original script can see that the author or authors made some major mistakes. Joel Barden from the Yale Divinity School describes how the flood is a great example of some of these mistakes. It says in one sentence that Noah took two of every animal onto his ark. Then at another spot it claims Noah took two of some animals. In one line it says the length of the flood was 40 days and in another it says 150 days. It's very likely the Old Testament was put together by a group of priests, then changed, edited, and inflated over the years by others who wanted to alter history. The Apocrypha The Biblical Apocrypha is a collection of texts that have been purposely left out of the Biblical canon. If it was up to the Roman Catholic Church, most of these texts would be obliterated and nobody would ever be able to read them. But just what in the world is Biblical canon? Biblical canon is the official series of texts that specific communities regard as the Holy Bible. The issue is that there are a lot of different Christian and Jewish sects, such as Protestantism and Catholicism. Most of these groups differentiate themselves based on what they believe to be the indisputable Bible. And if the Bible is up for debate, or at least the authenticity of its books, then the legitimacy of the whole thing begins to fade. One of the major differences is between the proto-canonical texts and the deuterocanonical texts. The proto-canonical books include all of what is written in the Old Testament, the first books read by the earliest Christians who believed every single word. The deuterocanonical texts include additional stories that were written later and were adopted by the Catholic Church as legitimate. In this case, the Protestants disagree and regard these texts as forbidden, and this is where we get to the heart of it. There are hundreds of texts that were written throughout the centuries as extensions of original biblical stories, things like giants, the infant life of Christ, and other secret teachings. Many of these stories have pagan influences, which is why the church cut them from their version of the Bible. But the truth is that there is no single version, and that for over 2,000 years, the Bible has been cut, edited, and manipulated. This is done in order to fit different ideologies and advance certain powerful people's agendas. The Osiris Myth The entire story of Jesus could be a retelling of the much older myth of Osiris. He's one of the oldest of the ancient Egyptian gods, first mentioned in funerary texts dating back to around the 24th century BC. 
He was there when the practice of mummification first began, believed to preside over the fate of the dead. More specifically, he was the ruler of the court which determined the fate of mighty kings after their death. He was also the brother and husband of Isis. You might be wondering what an ancient Egyptian god of the dead has to do with the Christian Messiah. The claim is that Jesus and Osiris share so many similarities that from an unbiased standpoint, they appear to have risen from the same inspiration. For example, Osiris is connected directly to the constellation Orion. His birth was announced by the three wise men, or the three stars in Orion's belt. The star that signified his birth was Sirius in the east. This is the same as the story of Jesus, whose birth was announced by the three wise men, who are personifications of the stars in Orion's belt. There are a few other similarities as well. Both Jesus and Osiris were killed and later resurrected, though in vastly different ways. Osiris had his body chopped into pieces and scattered across the world. Then later those pieces were put together and he was rejuvenated. Although he wasn't resurrected with a glorified body as Jesus was, instead Osiris descended into the underworld and became the Lord of the Dead. The Epic of Gilgamesh the Epic of Gilgamesh is an ancient poem written in Mesopotamia about 4,000 years ago. Scholars consider it to be the earliest example of fantastic literature in history. It's also the second oldest religious text that we know about, younger only than the mysterious pyramid text from Egypt's Old Kingdom. The epic, written on a clay tablet, consists of Sumerian stories about Gilgamesh, the great king of Uruk. Kind of like the Bible, the Epic of Gilgamesh started as five small chapters, then later incorporated more stories and became a serious religious book. But unfortunately, very few tablets have survived to reveal the full texts. But enough has been deciphered that we can compare the Epic of Gilgamesh directly to the Christian Bible. Surprisingly, there's a lot of shockingly similar stories. For example, the Book of Genesis and the Great Flood also appear in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Both stories talk about a great flood sweeping across the world. The only real difference is that Gilgamesh, who's the Jesus in the Sumerian stories, plays the role of Noah. Many biblical scholars even believe Gilgamesh and Noah were the same historical figure. Also, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the flood only lasted six days and nights instead of 40 days and nights. But the reason for the flood is the same in both stories. Humans became too unruly, and sinful, and so God sent the flood to destroy them. How long do you think the Great Flood really lasted? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button, Yahweh. Yahweh is the original name for the God of the Israelites, the name that was revealed to Moses in the book of Exodus. But what happened to the name of Yahweh, and why is it no longer used? Did the Israelites of the Bible have a different God than the one worshipped by modern Christians? If the Old Testament is the same as the Hebrew Bible, don't Jewish and Christian people worship the same Creator? This is where Christianity can get extremely complicated. After the Jews were exiled from Babylon in the 6th century BC, they stopped calling their God Yahweh. They changed the name to Elohim, partly because Yahweh was considered too sacred to be uttered, and because Elohim implied the Israelites' God was the one true creator. About a thousand years later in the 6th century AD, Latin scholars changed the letters of Yahweh and turned the name into Jehovah, which is still used in Christian sects today. The truth is that the word God is not a name but a title. The Jewish people, who were the ones behind the creation of a one true God, worshipped Yahweh over 3,000 years ago during the Bronze Age. Yahweh was the original inspiration for the God worshipped by all the Abrahamic faiths of today, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Attis of Phrygia Attis of Phrygia was the god of vegetation and the consort of the goddess Sabel in ancient Rome. According to the mythology, Attis was born from a virgin and was crucified on a tree. Then shortly after, Attis rose from the dead. If that sounds familiar, it's because Jesus had a very similar tale. Some have speculated that the tale of Jesus was copied from Attis of Phrygia. Either that or the cult of Attis stole their origin story from Jesus. The Attis cult began around the year 1250 BC, but it wasn't until the 4th century BC that Attis really became popular in the world of the Greeks. The basis of his story was that Attis was born through a bit of magic. 
His mother, Nana, a daughter of Sangarius, the river god, ate a fruit grown from a tree that sprang up from a pool of blood shed by the elder god Agdistus. Soon after, Nana found out she was pregnant and ended up giving birth to Attis. Her son then became a deity of vegetation. His story always revolved around his death and resurrection, representing the cycle by which vegetation is decreased in the summer and fall months and replenishes in the spring. He died in the winter, December 24th, and was resurrected again in the spring. It's just another example of how closely Jesus' story resembles other deities from the pagan world, the mystery religions. In the early days of the Roman Empire, mystery religions were all the craze. It was a bizarre religious movement that appeared in the first century AD, right around the time Christ was allegedly born and lasted for 500 years. Mystery religions could be found in Greece, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Persia, and of course, Rome. We call them mystery religions because very little more than that is known about them. It became popular for niche groups, families, and closely knit organizations to practice rituals and ceremonies in total privacy. The whole thing about mystery religions was that they had to be kept secret. They were, in essence, cults worshipping obscure pagan deities. You've most likely heard of a few mystery cults that caught on in a big way, like the cult of Dionysus in Greece and the cult of Osiris in Egypt. But there were dozens, even hundreds more. Each one was different, depending on the cultural influences of the region and the myths associated with the cult's chosen deity. Many scholars believe Christianity, in order to gain popularity, took a lot of its original ideology from these same mystery religions. They didn't just copy stories like the birth of Osiris or take traits from the pagan god Attis, but they stole entire belief systems and incorporated them into Christianity. It was a clever way for Christians to gain more followers, eventually emerging as the most popular religion, destroying all the other mystery religions in its wake. The Mithras Myth the cult of Christianity may have first emerged as an offshoot of the Roman cult of Mithras, which preceded Christianity by at least 600 years. Mithras was adopted by the Romans, taken from ancient Persia, and transformed into one of the most popular deities of the Roman Empire. The worship of Mithras peaked in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, at around the same time that Christianity was becoming popular. There's a possibility that the Mithras cult's ideologies and lore leaked into those of Christianity, or that they even spawned the story of Jesus themselves. The issue is that we have no written text describing the belief system of the Mithraic cult, and so the exact nature of Mithras is extremely mysterious. What we do know is that the god was supposedly born from solid rock and acted as an intermediary between the humans and the other gods. Mithras also supposedly had twelve disciples, which represented the twelve signs of the zodiac. Some scholars believe Jesus' own twelve disciples were meant to be representations of the zodiac as well, yet another tie between Christianity and paganism. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough details of Mithras and the cult that worshipped him, so we can't draw too many more parallels. The Romans worshipped Mithras in underground temples, at the same time Christians were starting to convert individuals belonging to the highest levels of society. Christianity eventually smothered the worship of Mithras, and the cult has been a mystery ever since. The Dionysus Connection There are no two figures more vastly different and the Greek god Dionysus and the son of the Christian god Jesus Christ. Jesus is the humble savior of humanity, while Dionysus is a party animal. But if you take a closer look, you can see how Jesus may be a copy of the pagan god of wine. For example, he lived among men as one of them, and he had a band of disciples. Jesus also allowed himself to be captured and persecuted before revealing himself to be the son of God. You can even see how the cult of Dionysus was used as groundwork for later Christian ideas. In the origin story of Dionysus, he is the son of Zeus and Persephone, the queen of the underworld. Zeus's wife becomes jealous and dismembers the child, then feeds the pieces to the titan. The only part that's saved is his heart. Zeus finds out what happened and destroys the titans in revenge. He then uses the heart to impregnate a human woman, thereby allowing Dionysus to be born a second time. This theme of being twice born was extremely important to the cult worshippers of Dionysus in ancient Greece. Initiates into the cult considered themselves born again, a phrase we see to this very day in Christianity. 
The Dark Ages of Obscurantism The Catholic Church may have been responsible for the rise of the Dark Ages at the end of the 4th century. It was around this time that Rome stopped supporting pagan religions and Christianity was embraced. They then proceeded to destroy all remnants of pagan culture in Europe. Everyone had to be Christian or they would have to face the consequences. While this may not seem so bad, it did end up leading to one of the darkest ages in human history. Within just a few decades, the church had brought in an era of obscurantism. But what in the world is obscurantism? Well, obscurantism is the practice of deliberately preventing facts and details of something from being known. In other words, willful misdirection. In religious terms, obscurantism prevents enlightenment. The Catholic Church did this by stunting scientific growth and dumbing down the population. They also kept everyone except for the topmost levels of the clergy illiterate. Prior to the Dark Ages, many people could read and write. It was just a common thing that people did. But once the church had taken over Europe, not even monks knew how to read. They simply looked at the words in their Bibles and believed they were holy symbols from God. Sure, there were barbarian hordes ravaging Europe during the Dark Ages, but the main source of turmoil for most people were the strict orders of obedience and authority imposed on them by the Catholic Church up until around the 1500s. That was when their corruption became so severe that the people began to resist. Giordano Bruno Giordano Bruno lived during a time when the Christian Church actively fought against scientific progress. He was born in Italy in early 1548, and over the course of his lifetime he became a respected philosopher, mathematician, and cosmological theorist. He's known these days specifically for his theories on the universe. He was one of the first people to propose that stars in the sky were each surrounded by their own planets. He was also one of the very first vocal supporters of alien life. It was Giordano's belief that each star was in its own galaxy, complete with its own planets and its own unique forms of life. He was also brave enough to insist that the universe is an infinite void with no center. These views and ideas were radical back in the 1500s, and yet they were 100% correct. Sadly for Giordano Bruno, the Roman Inquisition was not a big fan of his wild theories. They didn't like the idea of other life forms existing and were adamant that the Earth was the center of the universe. Bruno was charged with heresy for his denial of core Catholic doctrines. The Church also hated that Bruno taught others about the theory of transmigration of the soul, or more simply put, reincarnation. Unfortunately, on January 20th, 1600, the Inquisition found Bruno guilty on all charges, and he was consequently sentenced to death. The secular authorities hung him upside down and brutally burned him at the stake on February 17th of that same year. Bruno's ashes were then thrown into the Tiber River, selling indulgence. During the Middle Ages, it was taught by the Catholic Church that if you sinned in life, you would be punished in the afterlife. But to avoid a brutal punishment, you could pay a small sum of money. This was called an indulgence, and it was used by the Catholic Church as a way to scam people out of their hard-earned cash. Church officials would take payments from a sinner, promising that their money would convince God not to punish them so severely for the nasty things they did while they were alive. An individual who received an indulgence from the church would have to activate it by saying a specific prayer a certain number of times. Either that or they would be ordered to go on a pilgrimage, which meant visiting somewhere like a church or cemetery in order to perform good works. By the time the late Middle Ages had arrived, the church was severely abusing their system of indulgences. The church was making so much money from scamming people that it became a business. The church tried to rectify the problem, but it wasn't able to reverse the damage that had been done. It was this widespread corruption that ultimately led to the Protestant Reformation. It wasn't until the 20th century that reforms in the Catholic Church abolished indulgences. Instead of paying to have your sins removed, you simply had to spend time in penance, although at the beginning people confused penance with purgatory. This led to widespread panic and outrage. People believed the church expected them to do time in purgatory as if they were going to prison in the afterlife for their sins. Medieval Taxes the church dominated everybody's life in medieval England. Everyone from the village idiot to the town mayor believed that God, heaven, purgatory, and hell existed. They were also taught that the only way to get into heaven was through the Roman Catholic Church. People were terrified of going to hell as if it were a real place that they would be dragged to against their will. 
This fear led to easy manipulation and heavy taxation. The tithe was how the church really milked the ordinary people for as much as they could. Despite the hardships of medieval England, everyone paid 10% of their total annual earnings to the church. It could be paid in either money or produced goods. If a peasant didn't have cash, they could pay in harvested grain or chickens. The peasants were informed that if they refused to pay the tithe, they would go to hell. They didn't even need to be threatened with physical violence. Hell was a big enough motivator. The church made so much money from taxing everyone that King Henry VIII reformed it. He got rid of the Roman Catholic Church and established the Church of England so that he could be in control of the tax money. And that was the beginning of the English government squeezing taxes from the people. The First Crusade Pope Urban II may have been the worst pope in church history. The speech he made on November 22, 1095, was certainly one of the most influential, but it was also disastrous. Pope Urban II called to arms all the men in Europe that were capable of fighting. He urged all Christians with two arms and two legs to fight back against the Muslims in order to reclaim the Holy Land. He convinced the people with three words, God wills it. The Pope insisted that any Christian man who fought against the Muslims for their God would be granted a place in heaven, regardless of their sins. He essentially gave everyone permission to commit atrocities so long as they were fighting for God. And this was the beginning of the Crusades. The conflict had been going on already for almost 500 years. The European Christians had been visiting Jerusalem ever since the 6th century when it was taken over by Muslim forces. But in the 11th century, the Seljuk Turks took control of Jerusalem and banned Christians from entering the city. They then threatened to take Constantinople and to destroy the Byzantine Empire, and that was when Pope Urban interfered. The Pope used the opportunity to unite Europe under a Christian banner underneath his supreme authority. It was a major power move on his part, and it likely had very little to do with God. The motivation behind many soldiers going to fight in Jerusalem was far from holy. European nobles were enticed by the prospect of new riches and increased land holdings. Greed from every angle resulted in a bloody war that raged for the next two centuries. Do you think anything could have been done to prevent corruption from taking over the church? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Ramirez of Cambrai Ramirez of Cambrai was one of the first men in recorded history who was accused of heresy and burned alive. He is considered the first man in Europe to have been burned at the stake as a martyr. His story starts in the middle of the 11th century. He was a local priest who practiced his own version of Christianity. In 1067, when other priests tried to force him to accept communion, he refused. The bishop summoned Ramirez to court because he claimed the church's priesthood was corrupt. Ramirez then refused to accept the sacrament, and that was when things quickly turned violent. Since this was over 1,000 years ago, it's unclear exactly what happened. Most historical records point to an angry mob being responsible for the man's execution. After Ramirez refused to take the sacrament and was deemed a heretic, he was put in a small hut and kept prisoner. The mob then took him from the hut and tied him up before burning him as a heretic. Thomas Becket Thomas Becket, or St. Thomas of Canterbury, was a 12th century chancellor, born around the year 1120. He was the son of a wealthy merchant in London, and he grew up well-educated, so he quickly climbed through the ranks of the church. He became an agent to Theobald, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and was sent on various missions to Rome. King Henry II soon took notice of Thomas and made him his personal chancellor. They became close friends, and when Theobald died in 1161, the king gave the position of Archbishop to Thomas. At this point, the relationship between the Archbishop and the King was amiable, but over time, things started to sour. It soon became clear to Henry that Thomas was not going to put up with his meddling in the church. Thomas was a shockingly good and decent Archbishop, and the King didn't like that at all. King Henry was able to buy off the loyalty of the other clerics in the church, especially the higher English clergy. Thomas Becket was the only holdout, even refusing to sign documents that would give King Henry more power over the church. Church. The king soon grew tired of fighting with Thomas and instead planned to get rid of him once and for all. Realizing the precarious situation he was in, Thomas fled to France to live in exile. He returned in 1170, only to be murdered by supporters of the king who showed up to Canterbury Cathedral. Thomas, who may have been one of the only honest archbishops in English history, was killed for not being corrupt enough. Poorly behaved monks 
In July of 1531, John Longland, the Bishop of Lincoln, was charged with creating a tribunal to investigate rumors of poorly behaved monks. When John arrived at the Augustinian Abbey of Missenden in Buckinghamshire, he discovered nothing but bad behavior. Shortly after his arrival, John found out that the local canon, Robert Palmer, was having relations with a married woman named Margaret Bishop. To escape blame, the canon tried to blame the adultery on the abbot, John Fox. The abbot himself was already accused of nepotism, financial fraud, and possibly even impregnating his own sister. At the end of the inquiry, John sentenced Palmer to prison and suspended the abbot from office. This was very near to the time when the monasteries in England started to get dissolved. Ever since the 13th century, morality police had been exposing indiscretions across the British Isles. Monks and other church officials were found guilty of lewd behavior and negligence. They were also accused of sleeping during church service and public playing of dice. You didn't even need to be a member of clergy to be caught slighting God. In 1442, a man named Richard Gray was busted for getting a Benedictine nun pregnant at St. Michael's Priory in Stamford. He was found guilty of spiritual incest and was ordered to be flogged on the next four Sundays while walking through the church, dressed only in his linens. Pope John XII Octavianus of Spoleto was around 17 years old when he ascended to the papacy and became Pope John XII on December 16, 955 AD. Perhaps because of his youth, or maybe because he was granted the papal throne due to politics and ungodliness, he became one of the most infamous popes in history. His corruption was so severe that he's still talked about today as the demon that infiltrated the highest place in the church. His father was Alberic II of Spoleto, the effective ruler of the Papal States. His mother was either an obscure mistress or Alberic's wife, who also happened to be his stepsister. Whatever the case may be, Octavianus became the most powerful teenager in the world, seemingly overnight. As soon as he held the throne, he immediately began to make some extremely questionable decisions. Pope John XII ordained a ten-year-old as bishop, which was part of a larger problem of selling titles within the church to the highest bidder. He once ordained a deacon in a horse stable. He was accused of having relations with his father's mistress, presumably not the same woman who may have been his mother, and he had relations with his niece as well as multiple widows. Oh, and he was also a bit of a murderer. He allegedly blinded and killed a man, then castrated and murdered a subdeacon. This was the despicable state of the church until Pope John's death in 964 AD. His demise came after he was caught sleeping with a married woman. When her husband found out, he murdered the Pope the 40 Martyrs of England and Wales. The English Reformation was a brutal time for England. It began in the early 16th century with King Henry separating from the Roman Catholic Church. England moved out from under the authority of the Pope, and it was not an easy transition. Between 1535 and 1679, tens of thousands of people lost their lives. The 40 Martyrs of England and Wales are one of the more famous groups of people that were executed for breaking newly enacted laws during the Reformation. The group includes the Carthusian monks who declined King Henry's Act of Supremacy in 1535 and were killed. The Act of Supremacy established the English monarch as the head of the church instead of the Pope. All those who didn't agree, like the Carthusian monks, were murdered. 34 of the victims were hanged before they were chopped into four pieces. The other six were killed in various ways. The last executions were the seminary priests who were allegedly caught trying to assassinate Charles II in 1679. What do you think was the worst thing the church did in the Dark Ages? The Pope and the Mobster Anthony Raimondi, known as the enforcer for his time as a mafia hitman, recently claimed that he helped murder a pope to keep some of his friends out of hell. According to the New York Post, Anthony admitted to being one of the hitmen who murdered John Paul I in Italy in 1978. Just 33 days after John Paul I became Pope, Anthony allegedly helped feed him a cyanide capsule that ended his life. Unfortunately, there's no way to prove how much of this story is true. We know that in 1978, the unexpected death of John Paul shocked the world. He was Pope for just over a month before dying inexplicably. The official cause of death was heart attack, but nobody at the time believed it. Conspiracy theories began circulating immediately that the Pope had secretly been assassinated. If Anthony really is telling the truth, the Mafia hitman was responsible for the killing. 
Anthony claims he was hired by his cousin, Cardinal Paul Marcinkus, who controlled the Vatican Bank. Anthony says the cyanide was used so that he and his hitman buddies could kill the Pope without physically being in the room, which they believed would spare them a trip to hell in the afterlife. And apparently they killed Pope John Paul I because of a stock fraud run by insiders at the Vatican. The Pope had already threatened to expose the fraud, and so powerful men in the church reached out to American mobsters to silence him for good. The Gospel of Satan There's a black magic grimoire that's allegedly kept in the Vatican's secret archives, which has the power to put a person into contact with the devil. Its official name is the Grand Grimoire, but it's been called the Gospel of Satan, the Red Dragon, and other things as well. The book is filled with satanic imagery and was supposedly written in either the 1520s or the 1420s. Nobody has any idea who wrote it, but a lot of authors have been attributed with some of its sections. The introduction was supposedly written by a mysterious man named Antonio Veneciana del Rabina. Some of the writing even came from King Solomon 3,000 years ago. The contents of the book are frightening, to say the least. It's divided into two main sections, with the first containing instructions on how to summon a demon and how to then force it to do your bidding. The second major section in the book is all about making a pact with a demon, which is supposedly a lot easier than simply summoning it and then telling it what to do. And as if that wasn't enough, the book gives some useful instructions on how to win the lottery and how to make a girl fall in love with you. It also teaches how to turn invisible and how to practice necromancy. It's unclear if any of the spells in the book really work, but supposedly the Vatican keeps a copy for themselves stashed in a secret part of their legendary archives. The New World Order The Vatican is at the top of the New World Order conspiracy theory. You might have heard the term thrown around before, but let's do a full breakdown of what the New World Order supposedly is and how the Vatican fits into it. The New World Order is a secret group of elitists who have a global agenda to rule the world through a single government. That global government will obliterate sovereign nations and states, ruling over the entire world as one entity. Many believe the New World Order is the natural progression of human history. We started out in small tribes and have since progressed into various nations consisting of billions of people. The obvious next step is a single world united under one power. But as we've learned through history, ultimate power never ends well. The group of secret elites have supposedly been trying to put together their new order for centuries, and the Vatican is at the tip of the pyramid. The issue is that they've never been able to put all the pieces together to rule everything at once. It's an ongoing plot to achieve world domination, something the Catholic Church almost succeeded in doing during the medieval ages. Some Catholics even think the victory of the New World Order will signal the apocalypse. They even interpreted the biblical end of days as the rise of the New World Order led by the Antichrist after corrupting the Vatican. Secret Giants the Vatican is allegedly covering up the existence of giants. Throughout the course of human history, almost every ancient society told stories of giants. The Greeks believed in a land of giants, the Aztecs believed in giants, and even the Bible contained stories of giants called the Nephilim. Native Americans had giants in their legends, and early explorers in South America allegedly witnessed giant humans with their own eyes. The hard truth is that no matter where you look, people have always believed in the existence of giants. According to conspiracy theorists, the Vatican and the Smithsonian have been covering up evidence of the ancient behemoths for years. The Vatican is supposedly working with the Smithsonian to obscure the truth behind giant human skeletons. These skeletons have allegedly been found in North America, Ecuador, and even Europe. Huge humanoid bones were rumored to have been uncovered in the Ozarks. Skeletons of 12-foot, 3.7 meters tall men were found in a cave in Mexico. And there was even a graveyard of giants that was discovered in China. But the giant bones, not long after being found, suddenly vanished. Some say that's because the Vatican ordered the Smithsonian to help obtain, then destroy the giants to get rid of the evidence. Keep in mind, we have no real evidence of a conspiracy. There's no evidence of the giant human skeletons found in Ohio, nor is there proof of the ones found in Mexico. If the Vatican really is trying to cover up the prehistoric existence of a race of giant beings, nobody can say why they're doing it. Vatican Girl 
Emanuela Orlandi went missing in Vatican City in 1983 and has never been found. In early 2023, the Vatican opened yet another investigation into the missing girl. But just who is Emanuela and what happened to her? She was the daughter of a Vatican employee named Ercole Orlandi. He was an envoy of the prefecture of the pontifical house and he lived with his young daughter in Vatican City State. On June 22, 1983, 15-year-old Emanuela left a music lesson in Rome, but she never made it home. In 2019, members of the girl's family received information that her remains were buried in a cemetery on Vatican property. The family requested that the Vatican investigate and so they opened a pair of tombs. Inside, they found thousands of mysterious bones, but none of them belonged to the missing child. Scientific analysis of the bones revealed them to be ancient, perhaps belonging to other missing people from centuries ago. Sadly, the question remains. What happened to Emanuela Orlandi? One of the biggest conspiracy theories is that she was assassinated by agents from the Vatican. Orlandi allegedly confided in someone that she'd been abused by an individual very close to the Pope. To prevent the accusations from bringing even more shame upon the Vatican, the teenager was secretly kidnapped and was subsequently murdered. They then disposed of her remains in an unknown location. We don't have any proof of this, but it's one of the most popular conspiracy theories involving her disappearance. What do you think truly happened to Emanuela Orlandi? Do you truly think the Vatican was involved in her disappearance? Let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel, Jewish Treasure. There's a conspiracy theory that claims there's a secret stash of Jewish treasure hidden inside the walls of the Vatican. The treasure was apparently robbed from the Holy Land centuries ago. It was allegedly stolen from the Second Temple in Jerusalem, and all these years later, the Catholic Church still refuses to give it back. The conspiracy dates back to the year 70 AD, when the Roman army, led by General Titus, pillaged the Holy City, destroying the Second Temple and burning Jerusalem to the ground in the process. One of the artifacts stolen was a candelabra that was allegedly put in the First Temple by King Solomon himself a thousand years earlier. That would make it one of the oldest Jewish relics ever, and it was swiped by Roman soldiers. The candelabra supposedly made its way back to Rome and eventually wound up as a treasure hidden inside the Vatican vaults, and now the Pope refuses to give it back. This conspiracy theory isn't even as crazy as it might sound. In 1996, Shimon Satrit, the Israeli Minister of Religious Affairs, asked the Vatican to help find the lost treasures. Ten years later, the Israel Antiquities Authority sent a team of experts into the Vatican to search their storerooms. They didn't find any Jewish treasure, but that doesn't mean it isn't hidden somewhere else. The Freemason Pope In 1738, the Catholic Church officially prohibited all Catholics on Earth from becoming members of secret societies. One of those societies included the Masonic Order, otherwise known as the Freemasons. Over the past 300 years, multiple popes have publicly discussed the incompatibility of being Catholic and Freemason at the same time. Up until 1983, any practicing Catholic caught publicly supporting a Masonic organization was automatically excommunicated. The Declaration of Masonic Associations from 1983 states that any Catholic who enrolls in a Masonic association is committing a grave sin and is unable to receive Holy Communion. Based on this, it seems pretty clear the Catholic Church hates Freemasons. But why is it such a big deal? And are the rumors that claim Pope Paul VI was a Freemason true or false? The Catholic Church dislikes Freemasonry because they say it's anti-Catholic. They've claimed repeatedly that Freemasons actively deny the revelation of Christianity. It all started with the Inquisition's investigation of Masonic Lodge in 18th century Florence. The Church hates secrets, and uncovering a vast secret network really rubbed them the wrong way. Pope Clement XII wrote that the Freemasons were content with natural virtue and ripe with the taint of evil. But some say the Freemasons have been in the church the whole time. Pope Paul VI was allegedly a Freemason. The secret society supposedly infiltrated so much of the church that they were responsible for the recent change of attitude that allowed Catholics to join certain groups of Freemasons. The Third Secret Three Portuguese shepherds were visited by the Virgin Mary in 1917. Lucia Santos, Jacinta Marto, and Francisca Marto 
collectively saw an apparition of Mary six times that year. The alleged apparition became known as Our Lady of Fatima, and she supposedly entrusted the three young children with a trio of secrets. Those secrets were written down and kept hidden until two of them were revealed by Lucia in 1941. The first vision given to the young shepherds showed them souls being tortured in hell. It seemed to be a warning of what would happen to the humans of Earth if they continued down their sinful path. The second vision was of a great and terrible war, the result of a separation from God. This was supposedly meant to be a representation of World War II. The third secret was kept sealed in an envelope and wasn't opened until 1960. Even after it was opened, the Vatican kept the secret hidden until the year 2000. Only then did Pope John Paul II reveal the third vision to be the mass persecution of Christians. The three young shepherds were shown the persecution of Christians in the 21st century, just like when they were persecuted by the Romans 2,000 years earlier. But not everyone believes the third secret was revealed. There's a conspiracy theory that says Pope John Paul II lied about the third secret. He may have never revealed it at all. We don't know what the true secret might be, but it could be so devastating that not even the Pope will tell the public. The Lucifer Telescope In recent years, there's been rumors circulating that the Vatican has in its possession a satanic telescope. A conspiracy theory resurfaced on social media about the connection between the Vatican, the devil, and extraterrestrials. The Vatican supposedly owns a telescope named Lucifer, and they're using it to look for aliens in outer space. There's a weird amount of truth to the theory, although it's definitely not what the rumors make it out to be. It's true that there was a telescope called Lucifer, but it never belonged to the Vatican. The Vatican Observatory Research Group, which is based in Arizona, shares their space with other organizations. One of the organizations they share space with briefly nicknamed one of their instruments Lucifer in an attempt to create an acronym. However, they got so much heat for the name that they later changed it to Lucy. COVID-19 In 2022, an anti-vaccine documentary was released by a man named Stu Peters. The film was mostly viewed as nonsense by those who watched it, but it did put forth some extremely bizarre conspiracy theories surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the more ridiculous claims in the documentary was that the coronavirus was not a virus at all, but a synthetic snake venom distributed by the Vatican. The film claims that snake venom was synthesized by top Vatican scientists, who then unleashed it upon the world. But why would the Vatican do such a thing? It was supposedly to turn people into demonic hybrids by fundamentally changing their DNA. The conspiracy theory may sound bizarre, but it caught on very quickly. Within just two days of the film being released, it had over 640,000 views. For a brief period of time, the topic was trending on Twitter, showing just how many people believed the conspiracy to at least be plausible. But keep in mind the documentary was created by a far-right radio host with a history for bird-brained theories. Jesus' Secret Teachings Biblical scholars have recently discovered the very first known copy of an ancient forbidden text written in Greek. This text describes the secret teachings of Jesus Christ to his biological brother, James. The discovery was made by Jeffrey Smith and Brent Landau at the University of Texas. They found it in the Oxford University archives, where it had been buried for centuries. The texts come from the 6th century AD and were part of an ancient collection of religious writings known as the Nag Hammadi Library. The texts from the library were found in 1945, buried in Egypt. They complete a collection of 13 Coptic Gnostic books, known by some as the Gnostic Gospels. These were the holy books used by Gnostic Christians who believed in a more mystical Christianity. They were more about the spirit and the cosmos than a wrathful god. However, most of their books were banned by the church because they were seen as heretical or blasphemous. At least 13 Gnostic books were deemed forbidden and largely lost to history. The new pieces of text that were discovered come from the Gnostic book called The First Apocalypse of James. The document is shocking because it describes the teachings Jesus shared with his brother James. It discusses things like the heavenly realm outside our own reality and inevitable death. These teachings were much more mystical than the ones you find in the New Testament, which was exactly why they were erased by the church. The Book of Adam and Eve the Book of Adam and Eve is not something you're going to find in any traditional Bible. 
It's a story that describes what happened to Adam and Eve after they left the Garden of Eden. It's another one of those extra-biblical books that modern Christians say has no relevance in biblical canon. In truth, the book was written around the same time as many other biblical texts, a few hundred years before Christ, and it simply extends the story of the first two humans on Earth. As you may know already, the story of Adam and Eve is one of the oldest tales in human history. The first important event in the book is when Cain murders his brother Abel. The book claims that Cain and Abel both had twin sisters, meaning Adam and Eve had four kids, not just two. Cain fell in love with his own twin, but Adam and Eve wanted Cain to marry Abel's twin. Furious Cain murdered his brother, and the rest of the book discusses how the family tried to deal with it. It goes into some pretty gruesome detail. When a blood of Abel touched the earth, the planet trembled. Cain kept trying to bury his brother, but the grave kept spitting out Abel's body. Adam and Eve eventually took the body of Abel into a cave and laid it there to rest. The Infancy Gospel of Thomas In the Gnostic Christian texts found in Egypt, we see a lot more about the magical teachings that Jesus shared with his disciples. But there were also some other bizarre stories discovered in Egypt in 1945. The mysterious Nag Hammadi Library also contains a book called The Infancy Gospel of Thomas. This book is a biography covering the childhood days of Jesus Christ. It begins with his birth and moves through his childhood during the first century AD. Out of all the other Gnostic scripts that were never included in the Bible, this one was deemed heretical and was banned. In the 5th century, Pope Galazius I even added it to his list of heretical books that nobody was allowed to read. To give you an idea of how extreme Gnostic Christianity was, the infancy Gospel of Thomas was considered controversial even in the year 180 AD, when Arrhenius of Leon called it spurious, meaning false. Modern scholars believe the tale told in the book was likely transcribed from an oral story that had been passed on since the days of Jesus Christ. Nobody knows who authored the book, only that it does appear to detail Jesus' young years, and the story ends when Jesus turns 12. Yet even as a child, Jesus is depicted as a sage. There's a specific line in this story that you might find interesting. Jesus' teacher is telling him, say Alpha, but in response Jesus says, first tell me what is Beta and I can tell you what Alpha is. The books are filled with these strange cryptic riddles and teachings. The Mysteries of the Hebrew Bible New research just might change what we know about the early history of Christianity and Judaism. According to scientists from Tel Aviv University, a new discovery proves the Hebrew Bible was written much earlier than anyone realized. The research also suggests that in the Kingdom of Judah 2,600 years ago, there was a shockingly high level of literacy. Researchers used cutting-edge computerized image processing to analyze a collection of ink inscriptions found at the remote fort of Arad. They were able to determine that the Hebrew Bible was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Scraps of text found at the edge of the Kingdom of Judah show that the Hebrew Bible dates to at least the 7th century BC. Their research also proved that the Hebrew Bible was written by at least six people. This shatters the notion put forth by the church that Moses was the author of the Hebrew Bible. By analyzing the wording, phrasing, handwriting, and other tiny details, the computers solved the mystery. They were able to see what ordinary eyes could not, the faintest signatures of six like-minded authors. Researchers at the university believe there was a group of literate individuals in Judah who began work on what would become the most important book in history. But it wasn't until the fall of Jerusalem 200 years later that the book was finished and widely distributed. The Apocalypse of Adam The Apocalypse of Adam was found among the forbidden texts of the Nag Hammadi Library in 1945. It deals with the first man God created, Adam. On Adam's 700th birthday, he tells his son Seth about his life when he and Eve first met. Adam describes how he and Eve were even more powerful than their creator, a primeval entity called Yaldabaoth. This was the name of the Gnostic creator God, a serpent deity not unlike Satan himself. According to the Gnostics, he was the super-powerful being that created human life. He sent rays of light from the heavens into the humans' bodies to give them souls. 
But Yaldabaoth was envious and mean. He tried to limit the knowledge of his human creations by imposing nasty rules upon them. When Adam and Eve broke the rules, Yaldabaoth split them into two different genders, male and female, and promised them one day they would be forced to die. This is definitely one of the crazier books that was never added to the official Bible. It goes on to talk about hidden knowledge that Adam received from three mysterious men. Adam claims that the sub-creator God, the celestial being beneath Yaldabaoth, will try to destroy humanity by sending a global flood to wipe them out. Adam also says that after the flood, God will give the earth to Noah and that Noah's sons will inhabit the world. Humanity will then be forced to serve God in fear and slavery for the rest of time. What do you think really happened when Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. The Book of Giants The Book of Giants is by far one of the most exciting and fantastical forbidden books of the Bible. It's set in the days before the Flood, known as the Antediluvian Time. Its main characters are giants, angels, monsters, and a man named Enoch. It draws most of its inspiration from the Book of Genesis, although it isn't generally accepted as fact by Christian sects. It was discovered in fragments during the 1940s as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a true document and was written prior to the birth of Christ. And yet, it tells such a strange story that early Christians refused to add it to their official book. The Book of Giants says that angelic beings known as Watchers were ordered by God to watch over the earth. While they were watching, they became fascinated by human women. These angelic beings then abandoned their posts and bred with human women, which led to the creation of monstrous abominations called Nephilim. The book details how the giants knew it wasn't their fault, and yet their existence was an atrocity anyway. They even had dreams of the coming flood and their inevitable demise. The giant named Mahawe eventually sought help from Enoch, who told him that the giants needed to stop being so sinful. But the giants didn't want to end their wicked ways, and so they were all wiped out by the flood. The Watchers, who couldn't be killed by a little bit of water, were then rounded up by angels and locked up forever in a dark prison. The Apocalypse of Abraham Nobody knows who authored the Apocalypse of Abraham. It's an ancient biblical text based on the work of the Old Testament, likely written about 40 years after the death of Christ. The only surviving copy of this mysterious book is preserved in Old Slavonic, an ancient European language. It's not currently regarded as an official text by any religious sect, and supposedly it was only ever accepted by the extinct group known as the Bogomil sect. They were a neo-Gnostic group founded in Bulgaria in the 10th century. They never really caught on, and then out of nowhere, they vanished. The book revolves around the biblical Abraham, and the first eight chapters are a massive introduction. It talks about how Abraham slowly converts from believing in multiple deities to trusting in the one true God. This section is mainly a lesson in idolatry or the forbidden worship of false idols. But things only get stranger from here. Abraham is instructed to prepare a sacrifice high up on Mount Horeb. The angel Yahol, assisted by several other angels, is sent to help Abraham. But then the fallen angel Azazel shows up to seduce Abraham. Azazel comes in the form of an unclean bird, and he and Yahol get into a fight. Azazel is defeated, and the rest of the book talks about Abraham's ascension to heaven. God even gives Abraham a personal tour of the universe, showing him all the celestial bodies and all the tiny moving pieces of the world. Then, as a final treat, God gives Abraham a vision of the apocalypse. God shows him how the Messiah will come at the Day of Judgment to fight the Antichrist, and afterward, the world will cease to exist. The Ethiopic Bible If you're interested in a Bible that has it all, you need to switch from the King James Bible to the Ethiopic Bible. The King James Version, used by most people in the Western world, contains only 64 books. The Ethiopic Bible, on the other hand, has 84 books. This is because it includes most of the texts that have been lost or rejected by other churches. In Ethiopia, there is a Bible protected in a remote mountain monastery 800 years older than the King James Bible. This ancient version contains 88 books, including all three books of Maccabee and the highly controversial Book of Enoch. It's believed to be one of the earliest illustrated Christian books in the world, called the Garima Gospels. According to the legend, the ancient Bible was named after a monk who arrived in Ethiopia in the 5th century. The monk then wrote the massive book in just one day, 
because God stopped the sun from setting. The Pauline Epistles The letters of Paul, also known as the Pauline Epistles, are the thirteen books found in the New Testament that the Church attributes to Paul the Apostle. It's important to note that these are not forbidden books. The Pauline Epistles are in the New Testament and are considered canon by most Christian theologies. Epistles are letters, and in this case are the letters that Paul the Apostle supposedly wrote to the Romans, Galatians, Corinthians, Philippians, and Thessalonians. But although these books are official in the Bible, they aren't without their controversy. Most scholars agree that Paul wrote seven of the main letters, like the ones to the Romans and the Corinthians. Three of them, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, were likely written by somebody else. That other person could have been Paul's secretary. In other words, Paul wrote the main parts of the letters in the New Testament, and the rest of the work he shrugged off on a ghostwriter. If this is true, it means many parts of the Bible were written by somebody's secretary. But how could anyone possibly know this? It's because the style of writing is dramatically different, as is the theological content of the text. Biblical scholars with keen eyes have noted through the centuries that the letters were written by different people. The Apocalypse of Lamech the Apocalypse of Lamech is a mysterious ancient religious text discovered the year after the Gnostic texts were found in Egypt. It's one of the original seven Dead Sea Scrolls that were uncovered in 1946 in Israel. The book is composed entirely in Aramaic, with only four sheets of leather remaining. It's one of the least preserved Dead Sea Scrolls that we have, and so piecing together its contents proved difficult for researchers. The text was eventually deciphered as a conversation between Lamech and his son Noah. So far as experts are aware, there's only one copy in existence of this book. Roland de Vaux, a French Dominican priest who worked very closely with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, believes the Apocalypse of Lamech might be the original authored copy. It was likely written by the mystical sect of Jews known as the Essenes. They were a group of people who believed they were put on earth to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. Weirdly enough, they existed from between the 2nd century BC until shortly after Jesus' death and resurrection in the 1st century. Some say the Essenes had secret knowledge of Jesus' coming and had hidden the Dead Sea Scrolls on purpose for future generations to find. There isn't too much new information in this book that can't be found in other religious texts. It appears to be extra-biblical writing meaning it adds relevance to other stories in the Bible. This particular book adds more information about Abram's terrible treatment of Sarai in Egypt. It adds the fact that Abram was told by God to lie to the Pharaoh about Sarai being his sister, when in reality she was his wife. The Great Western Schism The Great Western Schism lasted from between 1378 to 1417. It was a time of great divide within the church, when three popes claimed to have authority over the Christian faith. This wasn't a theological splitting of the church, but rather one of politics. It all began in 1377 with the ascension of Pope Gregory XI in Rome. He mysteriously died the next year after only being pope for less than 12 months. Then the cardinals elected Pope Urban VI as the new pope in 1378. However, nobody liked him. Pope Urban was notorious for his violent temper, and this pushed many of the cardinals within the church out of Rome. Many of them travelled to Anagni, and while there, they elected Pope Clement VII to be the rightful pope instead of Gregory XI. At this point, there were two rightful popes trying to rule, one in Rome and one at the residence in Anagni. To make matters even worse, a third pope was elected by cardinals in Avignon as well. This caused problems immediately. The church was split, and the entire organization was in chaos. Then things were complicated even further when none of the popes wanted to forfeit their power. And in 1409, cardinals from both sides elected yet another pope, Pope Alexander V, to usurp the others and bring an end to the schism. Still, another five years passed with multiple popes claiming power, including the infamous pirate pope. The schism didn't come to an end until 1414 when the Council of Constance deposed all of the antipopes and elected Pope Martin V. Antipope Benedict XIII Benedict XIII, born under the name Pedro de Luna in 1328, was the second pope during the Great Western Schism. 
He's technically considered an anti-pope because his rule is seen as invalid. He reigned in opposition to the Roman Pope from his seat in Avignon from between 1394 and 1417. But just who was this false pope? He was a power-hungry thief who studied law at Montpellier University in southern France. He became a cardinal in 1375, and the schism began three years later. Benedict was originally loyal to Clement VII, who became the Pope in Avignon following the disaster with Pope Urban VI. But Clement died in 1394, and Benedict took his place. However, when Pope Benedict took over for Clement, it was with the understanding that he would renounce the throne voluntarily, if that would help stop the division in the church and reunite the Catholics. When that time came, he refused. This caused 18 of his 23 trusted cardinals to abandon him, at which point the French attacked his palace. Benedict barely escaped with his life. He had to rally the few cardinals he had remaining and tried desperately to come to an agreement with Pope Gregory XII, who was elected Pope of Rome in 1406. Then in 1409, the Council of Pisa was summoned to end the rift in the church. Pope Gregory and Pope Benedict were officially deposed, but Benedict still refused to give up his power. He hid at his castle in Peniscola and refused to leave even when all recognition of his power was taken away. Even though he had no power, he maintained until he died that he was the rightful pope. Pope Gregory XII Pope Gregory XII was elected by the cardinals in Rome in 1405 to take over the papacy from Innocent VII, who died unexpectedly only two years after he became pope. He was recognized as the true pope of the modern church, but this was hampered by anti-pope Benedict XIII in France, who refused to give up his power. Pope Gregory continuously tried to work things out with Benedict, only to be blocked at every turn. Gregory even attempted to organize a negotiation between the two of them. The popes were supposed to meet to work out their differences, but Benedict never showed up. In 1409, the council elected Alexander V to be the true pope and told Gregory he no longer held the throne. Nonetheless, Gregory stayed in power a little while longer, protected by Prince Charles of Malatesta and his other allies. He became just as obsessed with defending his seat as Benedict. Gregory went so far as to claim the newly elected Pope Alexander was a devastator of the church. He was forsaken by his cardinals, but remained the legal pope and was supported by the King of the Romans and the King of Naples. The Council of Constance finally put an end to the schism in 1415. Shortly after, Gregory accepted defeat and officially announced his resignation, while Benedict was still hiding in his Peniscola castle. Alexander V Pope Alexander V was elected by the Council of Pisa to end the schism on June 26, 1409. The council was sick of trying to work something out between the two popes, so they elected a third one to solve the issue. However, the problem still wouldn't be solved for another half a decade, while the other two popes struggled to maintain their power. Alexander immediately considered himself the rightful successor and would not step down no matter what happened. He claimed his legitimacy and the schism continued to wreak havoc on the church. Sadly for Alexander, his time in the spotlight didn't last long. He barely had any authority to begin with. He wasn't even allowed in Rome because Gregory XII refused to leave, and then he died suddenly in 1410. He'd been the Pope for barely a year before he died under dubious circumstances. Most historians believe he was poisoned by a man named Baldassare Cossa, who took over his position as the first ever pirate pope in history. The Pirate Pope Baldassare Cossa became the official leader of the Catholic Church in 1410, after the unexpected death of Pope Alexander V. Some believe Baldassare may have killed him in order to gain control of the church. He took the name of Pope John XXIII, and during his brief five years in office, he sullied the name of the Catholic Church unlike any other pope in history. He had a nasty reputation of seducing nuns, and he was known for betraying his allies. He also turned violently on Pope Gregory XII, who tried to excommunicate him. Cossa was born in the Bay of Naples sometime around 1365. He joined the family business as a young man, which just so happened to be piracy on the high seas. Both of his brothers were infamous pirates, and they were executed on the orders of King Ladislaus of Naples. Cossa worked as a mercenary captain, then slowly drifted from his life as a pirate 
to becoming a law student at the University of Bologna. It wasn't until he was around 30 that he joined the church and started making connections. His life as a pirate came in handy because he knew that he could intimidate people to get his way. He became a cardinal at the young age of 32, and from 1403 to 1408, he was the papal representative in Bologna. He then saw an opportunity to seize power because of the schism in the church. He started as a supporter of Pope Gregory, then turned on him and pushed his influence on the Council of Pisa. They then elected Alexander V and deposed Gregory, and shortly after, Alexander died under mysterious circumstances. It looks like Baldassare Corsa planned the whole thing to take the throne for himself. In the end, the pirate pope was directly responsible for the conflict that took place in Rome in 1413. He became enemies with King Ladislaus, the same man who killed his brothers, which resulted in Ladislaus turning his army on the city of Rome and pillaging it. The pirate pope was arrested shortly after, held prisoner until 1418, and then died a few months after being released by Pope Martin V. If you were called to serve as the Pope, what would your first decree be? Let us know in the comments, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. The First Great Schism Before the Great Western Schism, there was the original Great Schism of 1054. It began on July 16th when Michael Cerularius was excommunicated, splitting the church in such a way that it never recovered. Christianity was subsequently divided into Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox. The excommunication of Michael was the straw that broke the camel's back. Tension had already been high between the Roman Church in Rome and the Byzantine Church based in Constantinople. The schism started because of religious disagreements between the two sides of the church. They argued over the exact wording of certain religious documents and the belief that clerics should have to be celibate. To be entirely honest, the whole celibacy thing was likely the biggest fighting point for the Eastern Orthodox in Constantinople. In the end, the result was the same thing that happened with the Roman Empire. The church was too big and there were too many leaders recognized in their individual regions. It was the church in Rome that finally excommunicated everything to the East. It's been 1,000 years, and the two branches of Christianity have never reconciled their differences. There are about 1 billion Roman Catholics and roughly 260 million Eastern Orthodox today. Pope Benedict XIII Pietro Francesco Orsini changed his name at the age of 18, abandoned his inheritance, and entered the Dominican Order. He then joined the priesthood in February of 1671. However, even though Pietro abandoned his inheritance, he couldn't get rid of his family name. His political and financial ties eventually propelled him to the seat of the papacy, and he became Pope Benedict XIII on May 29, 1724. Pope Benedict was not the worst pope that ever lived, at least not intentionally. He was such a good pope that his goodness led to inadvertent badness. Pope Benedict was more concerned with doing good than being a politician or a statesman. He did things like dissolve the national lottery because he felt like it was a scam to make profit. He opened hospitals even though he had no idea how to manage them or staff them. He was the epitome of the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because he was so busy doing all his charitable works, he turned a blind eye to everything else. The politics were handled by Cardinal Kosha, who was a very bad man himself. He used the papal treasury like his own piggy bank and did massive damage to church funds. He did all of this while using the Pope as his own personal puppet. Pope Joan Pope Joan is considered to be the most mysterious leader of the Catholic Church by far. Oddly enough, there's no official record that Pope Joan even existed. The Vatican has official records of every single Catholic Pope in history, except for this one. According to the tale, Pope Joan was a young woman who disguised herself as a man and entered into the business of politics and religion. She became a distinguished scholar, she rose through the ranks of the church, and finally was elected to become Pope John VIII in 855 AD. She would rule for a few years with her true gender hidden under her robes, but then in 858 AD she accidentally went into labor during a procession. Legend has it the people of Rome were shocked and in hysterics as they witnessed the Pope, whom they all assumed was a man, give birth in front of them. However, this was the 9th century, 
and shock quickly turned to anger. After she gave birth to her baby, the female pope was allegedly dragged behind a horse while people threw rocks at her until she died. The Vatican then covered the whole thing up and got rid of any mention of her in their official records. Pope Leo X Pope Leo X was one of the worst popes in history. On March 9, 1513, he ascended to the chair of St. Peter and pretty much bankrupted the church within a short period of two years. The biggest issue with Pope Leo was that he started out with far too much power. He was born Giovanni de' Medici in Florence, 1475. That made him a member of one of the most powerful Roman families in Italian history. He essentially got on an elevator that would take him straight to the papacy without him needing to do much work. He was already the abbot of a monastery at the age of eight years old and became a cardinal by 13. Pope Julius II died on February 21st and Giovanni became Pope Leo X 18 days later. He was so used to being one of the wealthiest men in the world that he couldn't stop spending money. Within two years, he depleted a massive amount of money and just about broke the church. It's been estimated that in today's currency, Pope Leo spent about $675 million during his eight years in office. Surprisingly, his spending habits turned out to have some good consequences in the end. Rome flourished in a way that it hadn't in centuries, becoming a hub of culture and sophistication once more. But with all the money gone, Leo had to figure out a way to make more. He resorted to pawning palace furniture and treasure, and he sold statues of the apostles to make money. He also supported widespread corruption through the church by selling cardinal positions and seats in the church, as well as creating new offices. This explosion of corruption was what ultimately led to the Reformation. Pope Gregory IX Pope Gregory IX is remembered these days for being the leader of the Catholic Church who issued a papal bull, which was kind of like an official decree. In this papal bull, he claimed that cats contained the spirit of the devil. This would lead to one of the largest epidemics of cat murder in European history, and ultimately the Black Plague. Cats were almost wiped off the face of the earth, as people across Europe tried desperately to kill them all. Pope Gregory ultimately rose to power in 1227. He was the 178th Pope and arguably had the worst effect on humanity. He was known for his anger, his sharp temper, and his inhospitable personality. He did a lot of terrible things throughout his rule, such as burning heretics alive. But the worst thing he did was openly declare that cats contained within them the spirit of Satan. This declaration led to people hunting cats, burning them, putting them in sacks and throwing them in rivers. He incited mob violence against cats, who never did anything to deserve it. Just decades later, the lack of cats would lead to a massive boom in the rat population. Those hordes of rats would then spread the bubonic plague across Europe and would kill almost half the human race. Pope Gregory IX is the only pope who indirectly almost caused the extinction of humanity. Which of these popes do you think was the absolute worst? Let us know in the comments and thanks for watching. Remember to hit subscribe if you enjoyed today's video and we'll see you next time. Bye.